All right, um, this video is about what Fields Metal math professor Alon Khan means by his phrase two, three, infinity. So this is also the truth of the Pythagorean tetractus that I discussed yesterday. So um, if we learn basic math, mathematics, we learn that the uh, multiplication and addition are commutative, commutative as in symmetric, whereas uh, division is non commutative. But when we consider that modern Western math ever since Plato is secretly from music theory, then we can reveal the, what I call the bait and switch from music theory that reveals how time is inherently asymmetric and not commutative. Time is inherently non-commutative. And so Alain Khan calls this primitive time and Roger Penrose calls it fundamental time and math professor Lou Kaufman calls it primordial time. So when we studied the Pythagorean scale yesterday, I pointed out that secretly from Philolaeus, the value of one, the one, instead of being as listening in music, it is defined by the difference as a ratio between the perfect fifth and the octave or the and okay so then the in modern terms this is defined as based on exponentials and and also logarithms and so the the exponential rule assumes a commutative foundation based on zero as the identity being commutative. So based on music theory, in modern terms, we're told that um, three to the zero over 2 to the 0 equals 1 over 1 as the fundamental frequency ratio. Now, if you look up what um, 3 to the 0 means based on the, the powers of exponentiation, uh, there's a great video by a, a young uh, young lady math teacher talking about what does it mean to raise a power to zero. Um, and in fact, what it means is you're raising a power to one minus one, which equals zero. And if you raise a power to 1 minus 1, you're actually dividing 
the number by itself. And so that's why it equals one, because it's identity. But we know from music theory that the division is actually a process in time that is non-commutative and asymmetric. And therefore, when you say that when they start out the Pythagorean scale by stating that um, 3 to the 0 over 2 to the 0 equals 1 over 1, um, what they're essentially saying is that 3 to 1 minus 1 over 2 to um, th to the 1 minus 1 equals 1 over 1. So when you have a subtraction that is a that's a process of algebra of algebra, basic algebra, so you have to, it occurs in time, so you actually have 3 over 1, and then as 3 to the 1, and then you have minus, th 3 to the minus 1 is 1 over 3, but we know from, we know that division is non- non-commutative. So what's happening is a bait and switch in logic so that the um, the 3 to the 0 is is a reduction of 3 to 1 minus 1 and by reducing the process of 3 to 1 minus 1 then the inherent non-commutative identity of 1 and 0 is, is covered up. Is it, and, and so therefore, um, as I pointed out, um, the, in music theory, there, there can never be a um, perfect fourth as the overtone of the one when we're listening to the one. So in music theory, the, the two is the, the octave and the three is the perfect fifth. And so if it's one, th one third, then it's, it would, if you have one as equals C, as the root tonic, then the three is f five as a undertone, one third. But as an overtone, the three is a G, so it's three over one. Now, I had this discussion with um, Nobel physicist Brian Josephson who also um, composes music, and he asked me to comment on his music compositions. And then we, he commented on my music theory claim about the non-commutativity. And he dismissed it by saying that it doesn't matter you know, when you have a perfect fourth, if the three is in the denominator as one third, then <clears throat> you're just reversing the time. So, as I pointed out, um, as I pointed out yesterday, the, uh, Hold on. <clears throat> so if you have an, a drone and you play one note and then you play the second note to 
together as a perfect fourth, then that um, that perfect fourth actually creates an, an octave with the fundamental pitch being the new root tonic. So the first note is no longer the root tonic. So therefore, if the ratio is um, three to four and the um, four is the the geometric octave based on the pitch of the two, then the four becomes the new root tonic as the octave, but it was already the octave as the, um, in this case, it would be C, right? So the four is already the C. And this was Brian Josephson's point to me. He's like, it doesn't matter because you have, in the harmonic series, you have the ratio of three to, three to four or, or it's four to three, and you can switch it around, you know, as G to C. So um, C, C to G is three halves, three halves because the C is the, the octave as the, the root tonic. But then G to C is um, four thirds. So you, you, you can see, you can start to understand the non commutative um, it, okay, if you say, if you say, um, okay, C to G is, is, uh, three halves, or, uh, yeah, it has to be three halves, because it's the overtone series. So you have to think of the way the, in, you have to see the time visually, so it's kind of hard to do. See, because when you hear three halves, you think the G is first, but it's not the C. The C is actually first. So um, when we think of um, uh, four thirds, then the the C, the, the G is actually first because we're going in that same direction and and you can't do that you can have you can't have the g as the denominator and i'll say uh, it's it's kind of hard to figure out the there's another way to explain this that makes it much simpler is that the the perfect fourth in this in the same scale of the octave is actually C to F, not C to G. So the, the four thirds is actually C to F. And so that's this is the point that the Indian drone is making, is that when you when you play a root tonic and then a, a perfect fourth as a drone, then all of a sudden the um what was a four thirds becomes three three fourths in the sense that the the F is now the new root tonic. Um and so the the um the ratio has to be created from a different root tonic. And th this is what um this is what Phil Elias did, you know, originally when he created the very first logarithmic equation using geometric magnitude from music theory. So he he used the the zero to eight as the the root tonic f for the um for the uh, perfect fourth as 
so the wavelength is eight to is uh, six eighths, and then the frequency is eight six, which reduces to four thirds, and then you and then you put that back into the zero to twelve wavelength, so that the what was a three for four thirds as six is now the octave as the two. And so that's the bait, bait and switch. And then you can say that um, 12 eighths as three halves plus um, eight six as four thirds equals the octave as 12 over six. Um, so you can you can create that first logarithmic equation by changing the value of the one as defined by 0 to 8 and 0 to 12. And so this original use of 0 was considered to be a materialistic negative infinity. And Aristotle was against it. Um, and so when you have these, these, you have, you try to have this identity of the, um, zero as a exponential with three to the zero at, at over two to the zero equaling one, then you're covering up the fact that 3 to the 0 is actually this algebraic non-commutative process of of division with that's that's non non-commutative so you have 3 over 1 and 1 over 3 and one of them it, if you look at that that you know the 3 equals f in music theory, the three would be f as one over three, and then the three would be g as three over one. So you you can't just say it's three to the zero as a symmetric um, uh, sub a symmetric subtraction of one minus one. That's commutative. You can't you can't convert that into a commutative three to the zero when in fact it's a non-commutative um, division when you subtract the when you subtract the exponentials. And so by hiding the fact that it's non-commutative, then the Pythagorean scale hides the fact that as Alain Khan points out the um, perfect fifth as the defined as 2 to the 7th power of 12 or the or an, which is an, another way of saying the 7th the 7th root of, of 2 to the the seventh power of two to the, let's see, it's the seventh root of the square root of two to the 12th. Yeah, there we go. The seventh root of two to the 12th. Um, so the, that's the perfect fifth as defined by um, the Pythagorean scale. But what Alain Kahn's is pointing out is that that's ignoring the fact that the Pythagorean comma, as defined by uh, Philolaus, is um, three to the the twelfth and two to the nineteenth, then is non-commutative for the when you put it back into the same scale. Uh, so it's um, three to the 
the 1 19th and 2 to the 1 12th. <clears throat> so um, this uh, this process of this non commutative process starts originally when you're you're reversing see the the very original logarithm was from music theory based on this idea of subtracting the perfect fifth from the perfect fourth to get um, nine eighths nine eighths as the difference the supposed difference between the the um, perfect fifth and the perfect fourth um, but that's assuming again a secret uh, different value of the one as the the root tonic with a different value of zero you know zero to eight and then zero to twelve <clears throat> and so then you can you can cover up the fact that the um the perfect fifth it, as three halves and the perfect fourth as three fourths or originates the perfect the perfect fourth as as um four thirds originates from the perfect fifth as two thirds see it doesn't originate from three fourths so that's where the the non commutative um see um brian nobel physicist brian Josephson is saying you can just switch around four thirds and three fourths and it doesn't matter and so then if we go to um the nobel physicist brian josephson's uh nobel laureate speech he talks about how the josephson effect relies on an inherent um time symmetry or space-time um breaking they call this a spontaneous spontaneous breaking of space-time symmetry um but the this this is already assu assuming that space-time is symmetric but if um time is inherently asymmetric then space-time is also inherently asymmetric and there's no there's no zero rest frame of symmetric space-time and this is um professor basil j hiley's uh, point that he he may also um john g williamson makes this point about um louis de Broglie's law of phase harmony he says that 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 proves that um there's no zero rest frame of space-time and this this zero rest frame is this assuming a, a symmetry and that symmetry is from the originally from the pythagorean theorem and so there's a book called you know from pythagoras to einstein you know because you can it's the same mathematics for relativity you're just extending it and of course the since we're doing an, an external measurement um that's slower than the speed of light then we're assuming um this symmetric uh, perception as a ratio of uh, geometry but in terms of quantum physics for the photon it has uh, the zero rest mass of the photon is actually non-commutative so it, it inherently has this momentum from time and frequency and that's the whole secret of um, what Penrose is pointing out that the origin of the universe is due to highly asymmetric time um, 
that's also highly coherent as the law of phase harmony. And he includes the, he relies on the De Broglie-Einstein relation to derive this, this concept that mass is fundamentally frequency. And, and therefore the origin of the universe is from um, the negative resonance of negative frequency and reverse time. And this exists in, the, in pure, pure time before space time. So like in pure time, there's no sense of size because it's, there's no sense of space. There's no size. So this is like just <clears throat> unacceptable to most people because we define reality based on our senses that assume a sense of size and form, you know. <clears throat> but if you're if you're relying on um, listening as music, then you can logically infer this realm of pure time where the future is um, guiding us, guiding matter as an inherent harmonization of reality. And um, so this is also what um, Alan Khan means by the phrase two, three, infinity, because he's He's stating that um, our brain is doing a four-year transformation, but not as a um, mathematical function or axiom or algorithm, but rather as a four-year transformation on space-time itself from a more primitive um, time frequency that's non-commutative. So the, the non-commutative time is not linear because the future and the past overlap, whereas the modern sense of um, causality assumes a linear time as defined by symmetric space. And that's what we call space-time in, in physics. And um, so um, recently I posted yesterday how they've, you know, Google created this quantum computer that uses a time crystal using lasers. So again, this is the whole concept of, of the photon that the zero rest mass of the photon is actually non-commutative. And that goes directly back to this definition of what is a number to the zero power. It's actually a non-commutative process of division of the one relative to that number. And that process is from music theory originally, from non-Western, you know, Pythagorean music theory. That's the secret of the, the logos. And it and um, math professor Lou Kaufman explains this algebra also in terms of the Pythagorean theorem and the imaginary number as an algebraic process so that the when you measure a change in position, that measurement process takes time. So that's what you know, time frequency uncertainty originates from, but it's actually a non-commutative process. So we can listen to the future and the past at the same time um, faster than this, than the time necessary to convert the frequency back into time. When, once we realize that, um, if we listen to the source of the one, then we can listen to both the overtones and undertones 
at the same time because they naturally they naturally resonate and we like we hear this of with like throats throat singing in um you know from like mongolia or the tibetan um monk chanting the it, that in order to do that you actually have to listen to the highest highest note that you can hear through meditation and that causes the vagus nerve the right side vagus nerve to relax the throat muscles very deeply due to the um ultrasonic ionization of the of the brain through meditation and so there's this there's this direct process of overtones creating a significant in ampl amplification increase in the undertones and this was the point of um brian goodwin the biology a biologist who studied um well i guess he called it chaos i think it was chaotic biology or something like that but he his whole point was like a the um an increase in frequency causes a significant the undertone the subharmonic is a significant increase in amplitude and so this this gets into the whole concept of reverse time as the quantum quantum undertone or the quantum beat from the future and because it's not it's not amplitude in the standard definition of amplitude based on squaring so the normal uh, understanding of quantum physics assumes you have to square the amplitude to get the probability the amplitude probability distribution as a density for mass of space-time but in fact you can um, once again when you have a non-commutative time with frequency then you don't you don't cancel out the um, negative frequency by squaring it um, is through the imaginary number you know that in the in a complex um, what they call the block block sphere so this is the origin of spin and that and that's also the origin of the quantum measurement problem because the electron has a one-half spin but it can't be measured until it has a 720 degree um, um, geometry which which is a non-commutative um, process so that's why that's why matter is dense and and has substance to it because of this one half spin that um Wolfgang Pauli you know first um modeled and then he, and so that's why Wolfgang Pauli also believed in synchronicities of consciousness based on this spin interacting that's non-local and um and that's what the the, the Dirac dance is and, and that's also a Tai Chi um, exercise called the silk reeling exercise and that it explains all the secrets of um, Nagong or internal martial arts based on the hand movements with the body being um, non-commutative as Eddie Oceans explained you know like in, in Wing Chun that he taught of Bruce Lee's lineage the whole secret is that it's non-commutative so like um the outside of your hand is yang and the inside of your hand is yin and then your lower body is yin, but your upper body is yang. So when you do the Dirac dance, then your um, your yin, the yin of your hand, the yang of your hand is facing the yin of your body, 
when you when you spin your hand upside down and then when you spin it up then the yin of your hand is facing the yang of your body and so each of those positions would be the equivalent of the one half electron as the one half spin i mean not the one half electron i mean it's the electron as the one half spin and what um john g williamson and uh Martin Vandermark argues that the, the electron is actually light as the, um, from Dirac, you know, with the light being the negative frequency and reverse time at the same time in this fifth, fifth dimension of time, that's actually the 720 degree spin, you know, at the same time. Um, so the so the the light inherently has this relativistic mass as um, a new force. It's a newly discovered force uh, from the future. And so it's a reverse time and negative frequency as a newly discovered force that um, Professor Basil J. Hiley calls it the causal force. Um, from Aristotle, so um, the it has to be called a force because it's before you square the amplitude as a as the based on the imaginary a square root of negative one. Um, so it's also inherently non-local, and um, it's eternally, as Yogananda says, it's ever fresh and ever new because it's eternally from the future and it's 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 kind of <laughs> anyway i'm gonna leave it at that and um thanks for letting me ramble and rant for over a half hour